So, Jamil, you've been taking a look at some of those questions that are coming in. Um, obviously, there are people who've got strong views. We have to be very careful in terms of the ones that we cover. Jamil, just give me a sense of a couple of those questions. Hi, Mark. Yeah, lots of um, prayers and wishes coming in today from all around the world. Uh, as you mentioned, Canada and even South Africa as well. Um, we have a, a, a more of a statement here which says we should get all DASCAM uh, from the area around the time, even if it is nothing. Um, we've got a question that says, how easy is it for the body to go over that weir? Some people still asking questions about the, the river. Um, also, uh, have the police indicate, indicated whether they will be giving another press conference anytime soon? Um, and also, has any article of clothing been found? So well, those are the questions now. Let me deal with the first and the, and the last one. I'll bring you in, Abigail, for the, for the uh, second one. So could she have gone over the weir? So let's describe the weir. So the weir is a position where uh, water breaks over a, a barrier. And then beyond that, as you can see now from the shots, beyond that is pebbles. It's, it's very shallow there. And in fact, that distance of pebbles runs for quite some way. Uh, and whilst the water was at a higher level, it certainly wasn't a position where somebody could actually travel over that. That's highly unlikely she would have got caught in that. Uh, there's also a position whereby uh, down the bank, so we've talked a lot about, and you can see from the pictures there where that bench is, uh, from the bank, from the bench, when you get into the water, that is stones. There are stones down the bank. So had she have fallen or gone into that river, she would have gone into uh, stones. There's some distance before it ends, goes into a deeper, deeper area. So if she were to have travelled down that bank to recover a ball or something like that, the police have suggested that she maybe have gone in there to try and recover something for the dog. Of course, they don't know that. That's total supposition. Uh, and in it, because of the dog, of course, can't tell them anything. Imagine if it could, you know, so many in these circumstances when you've got either young children there or animals there. You know, if they could only speak, you would be able to solve many, many more crimes. Of course, that's not reality. So you have to piece it together themselves. But I know speaking to Peter, he says very clearly that it's highly unlikely that she would have been able to fall into the to the uh, water from that bench area because there were stones below. Dealing with the point in terms of clothing, no clothing. That has been found in relation to any of the searches in the water. Abigail, in relation to a press conference, we had one uh, yesterday, but, but have you any information that there's likely to be another one today ahead of the weekend? We have had information from the police and there isn't going to be a, a press conference today. Um, so we won't be receiving any more uh, information from the police uh, directly that way. Of course, there might be updates that come through the media team um, and are reported, but no, no press conference expected. Just before I go back to you, Jamil, Jodie, can you just have a look at the press conference, the, the last press conference? I just want to play the clips where uh, Superintendent Riley is talking in terms of the levels of inquiries, the, the 500 outstanding inquiries and the 700 drivers they're trying to trace. Jamil, any other questions? Yeah, one of the one of the th um, the topics that a lot of people are discussing in the comments is what is the next steps if nothing is found out at sea? What are the what are the next steps that police are going to take? So obviously, I'm not party to the police investigation that will be being kept, you know, w within the police structure. Even you know Peter Fordy, who was up there, Specialist Group International, they were provided with certain information. Uh, there'll be a tight knit team, a senior command, who will obviously be being told a certain amount, and then uh, the officers. There will most probably be daily briefings, maybe two briefings. Certainly, in major investigations, there's often a briefing in the morning and a briefing in the afternoon, and actions given. And so, let me just break it down in terms of terminology. So an inquiry is, is set out. So please uh, start an investigation. And depending on the size of it, and in this case, huge media attention, that will require significant resources because people will phone up, people will send emails in, giving pieces of information, snippets, maybe something's happened to them, maybe they've got some pieces of information, of uh, something they saw on the day, or just a general thought that they want to provide to the police to say it may connect. Those will come into the incident room. They will then be recorded. 
uh, and then it will go through to oh, they will be running this on a home system so the home office large major inquiry system they will then take those inquiries in and there will be an allocator uh, and there will be a supervisor who oversees that they will look at it and they will prioritize it will triage to see whether those inquiries require urgent attention or whether or not they can be done in slow time and also of course whether they link to other ongoing inquiries at the moment those are then called actions they're given to officers to then go and carry out and we often refer to a tie which is trace interview and eliminate so they may do that in relation to specific individuals. Uh, so those actions will be allocated to uh, people. And then we can see that actually the police have allocated or have 500 actions that they talked about the other day. Let's just listen to Superintendent Riley as she talks about that. I want to take you through the unprecedented number of inquiries that the police team has been doing in the last 11 days. Mm -hmm. We've received literally thousands of pieces of information from the public, the wider community, Nicola's family and friends, which we've been combing through diligently. This means at the moment there are around 500 active pieces of information and lines of inquiry that we're working on to try and find answers for Nicola's family. We have a team of 40 or so detectives under a senior investigating officer working daily to comb through this enormous amount of information. This is normal in a missing person inquiry and does not indicate that there is any suspicious element to this story. The inquiry team remains fully open-minded to any information that may indicate where Nicola is or what happened to her. Some of the, the specific pieces of information and the lines of inquiry that they've been undertaking include house to house in the village, looking at CCTV, the various pieces of dash cam that have been submitted to the inquiry, identifying and tracing and speaking to key witnesses, a number of whom have come into the inquiry and been spoken to and given valuable information. Digital and telephony, this includes Nicola's Fitbit and her mobile phone, which has been uh, fully examined. And we've now identified around 700 vehicles that drove through the village on that morning, on the 27th of January at around 9.10, 9.15. And we're in the process of speaking to all of those drivers to try and find out if they have any dash cam footage, what they saw on that day, or anything else that may be of value to the police inquiry. I was Superintendent Riley talking in terms of the inquiries that are being dealt with in the back end, obviously away from the, uh, the search at the river. So one question Nikki uh, Harper has asked is, is it likely another police force would be brought in? Well, Superintendent Riley's talked herself in terms of the fact that there's been a peer review by the National Crime Agency have looked at it and considered that they are doing the right lines of inquiries. Uh, this will continue. There will most probably be another review uh, of the very short period of time, probably almost, it's normally about two weeks. So there will be another one uh, which will take place. Uh, there will be a senior investigating officer, uh, possibly externally, but certainly with internally, who will be looking at this to consider whether or not there are lines of inquiry that have been missed. And it's very easy because it's very easy when you're a senior investigating officer to become you know, totally engrossed in what you're doing and perhaps slightly miss some of the other elements. You become potentially quite subjective in terms of what you're looking at. Of course, that's not what they're trained to do, but it's it's inevitable sometimes that as a senior investigating officer, you form a hypothesis and then you look down the route looking for that. And sometimes you may miss other elements that come into it. So peer reviews are, are really important. Gone are the days where they would refer to bringing in New Scotland Yard, you know, the great train robbery. Oh, let's bring in great New Scotland Yard, all police forces now. 
have very experienced senior veterinary officers. They all go on the senior command course uh, and they are very experienced in dealing with major crimes. Some forces better than others, undoubtedly, in terms of the types of crimes that they will deal with. Uh, and Lancashire is one of the very smaller ones. There's no doubt about that. You know, major crime to them is is far less frequent than it would be perhaps to a you know a home counties force such, such as Surrey or the Metropolitan Police or Greater Manchester Police. Uh, but they still do have serious crime and of course police forces communicate with each other the senior command course is of the same structure so individuals whatever police force you're going from you are gaining the same experience uh, as officers from the larger forces so uh, it's very easy for people to say you know lancashire have got this wrong lancashire have got some things wrong there's no doubt about this there are some learning curves for them i think particularly in relation to the way that, that they've given their messages out and handled the media uh, but overall, they've done a very good job. They are certainly working tirelessly to try and get answers for Nicola's family in terms of what's happened to them. And sometimes this takes time. You know, there's nothing obvious on the plate for them. They've come up with a hypothesis. That's what they focused on. I think we're seeing now that that will probably run its course and... and um, and we'll get to a position where by you know they haven't been able to find Nicholas. I just hope that at that point that they look around and say, well, you know, maybe we got that wrong. That's very unlikely with police forces. One of the criticisms I apply to police forces and senior officers is, is that reluctance to say, you know, maybe I got it wrong. And actually, you know, maybe we need to look somewhere else. That's very rare within police forces. Uh, and of course, nobody in any circumstances really wants to admit they've got it wrong because, you know, that's a very hard thing to do. But what a good thing to do. You know, I'm always critical of, of individuals and, and I will always give praise to senior investigating officers who turn around and say, you know, actually probably went down the wrong path there. Maybe we got that wrong.